So I'll talk about effective guiding and parenting broadly using three metaphors. So this is what overall I'm going to speak. We'll look at how Drona trained the Pandavas. Then I'll talk about three metaphors and this PGD. That is the three metaphors I'm going to talk about. Then three principles based on the same acronym. And then we'll talk about the principle of detachment, what it means and what it doesn't. So now, <coughs> Drona was uh, almost like a surrogate parent for the Pandavas. When Pandu passed away, he came back. Now, Dhritarashtra was, was a, the kind of parent whom nobody should have. Neither the Pandavas nor the Kauravas should have had. Bhishma was their grandsire and he was close to them. But Drona was the person with whom they spent the most time. Bhishma was busy with the royal administration. So now we see that all five were born in a Kshatriya family. And all five grew up to be Kshatriyas. So in a sense, their education, their growth, since we are talking here about mainly career guidance, what they should do in their life. So this Drona, how Drona guided the Pandavas is a useful model for us to take. So there was a common training that was given to all students in his academy. But while the training was being given, Drona was observing carefully. And then as he observed that each of the Pandavas excelled in certain things. So there was a common training and when he saw that they were excelling in particular things, there was customized training. So Arjuna excelled in archery. And everybody had to learn archery, all warriors had to. But Arjuna would practice more and Drona would teach him special tr uh, skills and special tricks and Arjuna would excel in those also. Similarly with Bhima. So with respect to the specific skills that were taught in, the, in Drona's academy, these two were standout talents. Bhima was in mace fighting and uh, Arjuna was in archery. So basically, similarly, we could say when we are trying to help our children grow. At that time, there is an overall standard trajectory. Say they go to school, then they go to college, then they go to university, or then they take up a job. There's a standard trajectory that everyone follows. But in that standard trajectory, which is a common path, there needs to be customization. Now, if Bhima had been told, become an archer like Arjuna, he was a good archer. But his special strength would not have been developed. If Arjuna had been told, become a mace fighter like Bhima, although Arjuna was also a powerful Kshatriya, he did not have the power that Bhima had. So Drona noticed the individual talents and nourished them accordingly. Of course, Arjuna could also fight with a mace and Bhima could also fight with an arrow. So Srila Prabhupada said at one time that knowledge means to know everything about something and something about everything. Of course, Prabhupada is quoting some other scholar, some other thing, Western thinker who said the same thing. So the point is that there is a common path which is important to follow, but at the same time there has to be customization. So this balance between common and customized is what we will be talking about in the three metaphors. So the three metaphors I'm going to talk about is pottery is the first metaphor. So in pottery, the idea is the clay is shapeless and the potter shapes the clay into whatever kind of pot that the uh, potter wants. It could be circular, it could be oblong, it could be a pan, whatever it is. <coughs> so many parents have this model of parenting that you know, we will tell our child what to do and the child will do it. And this model has worked traditionally also in the sense that if you see previous cultures or previous generations, not necessarily previous cultures, they were much more uh, hierarchical, top down. Mm -hmm. So but hierarchical means you give the instruction and the instruction is followed. So this applies not just to career, say it applies to marriage also. Say for example, the parents would say to the boy and the girl, you get married to this boy or this girl and they would agree. 
but that same model may not always work. But so this was one time-honored model. And within that, the philosophical idea is that the children are like clay. So whichever way they are to be shaped, the parents will shape them. Now, I'll talk about the merits and demerits of each model in later, but that's the first model, first metaphor we can have. The second metaphor could be like of gardening. So in the case of gardening, the seeds are already having the potential to grow into particular flowers. And the gardener simply facilitates the blossoming of the, the, the growth of the plant and the transformation of the seed into a flower. So no matter how expert a gardener is, a gardener cannot consider, convert a sunflower seed into a, a rose flower. So this, I, this the, metaphor, the underlying idea of this metaphor is that children have their innate natures and parents can't reshape them. So <clears throat> to some extent, uh, in the Western world, especially in the westernized culture, at least nowadays, parents adopt a very hands-off approach. It's like it's your life, you do what you want to do with it. So we could say traditional parenting was more according to the pottery model. Contemporary parenting errs on the side of extreme leniency, where they treat the child like a seed. You grow. But uh, you just, what you want to do, you do with your life. I was with an American family, and uh, I was talking with them. I asked the father, what does your daughter do? Uh, he said, I don't know. What? She is exploring various career options and she chose one of them. I have not had time to talk which one she chose. Really? I felt that's too extreme. But he was quite nonchalant about it. So this, if the child, A, for some people, they are very, very clear about what they want to do. So here we are not talking in terms of right or wrong. These are just metaphors. And the third metaphor will be of driving. Now, in the case of driving, everybody needs to learn some basic driving skills. Hmm. Whoever they may be. And the driving skills are to be learned are universal. And everybody needs to learn how to take directions, how to follow directions, how to follow a map. But everybody may eventually drive a different car. And now we may say cars may be similar, but for us, if we consider ourselves as souls in particular bodies, each body is different. And therefore, each driving experience is significantly different. Srila Prabhupada used a similar metaphor while talking about how the relationship between the spiritual master and a disciple. He says that every spiritual seeker has to fly one's own plane. So we have to fly our own plane. The spiritual master can give us guidance, and it's important to take that guidance. But eventually in the air, the fighter pilots are alone. So in some ways, the idea is that the parents, in this metaphor, the idea is the parents can provide the children the skills. But it is the children who have to drive. And now we could even tell them, OK, you go over there. That is the destination you want to go to. While going to the destination, we might suggest a path. Uh, they might choose that path or they might choose some other path. That means we may say, okay, whatever you want to do is fine, but you should, be fi you should be financially stable, you should have a good family, you should have a stable spirituality. That's what we want. That's the direction we want you to go. But now they may choose a path. We might recommend a particular path, but they might choose a particular path uh, different from ours, what we are recommended. So broadly, the driving skills can be taught and the direction can be given. The specific path, the specific route that they use for driving may be different. So among these three metaphors, does any of these three relate especially to you? Yes. Which one? The driving one. The driving one? Yeah. So it's a, the two things you said there. Guidance and uh, how 
the, if you don't know the destination, then route can be multiple. And that's yeah. Taking, wasting yeah. time and lots of things. That's true. So we can basically sometimes we might give a destination, but sometimes they may not even accept the destination. Yes. Then it becomes a problem. Yeah, any anyone else? Honestly, in my case, I feel like I'm uh, bouncing between all three. So I push my limit and try a traditional method, and I'm like, oh, oops, this didn't work. So you know, step back. Hmm. And I try the government method, but then there's just so much I can wait and pull it off. So then I tend to jump on the driving method. So yeah. I'm definitely hopping on all That's true. And I wouldn't like uh, the hopping. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say either of these is right or wrong. See, one of the challenges in life is we all want balance, yeah. but balance is never static; it is dynamic. That means that, say, if you are riding a cycle, at that time the balance state is the vertical state. But if you want to turn right, then the balance state for the cycle is tilted right. Only then it will move on. Balanced means with a position where you can move in the desired direction. But after turning, if it still stays tilted, then it will go in a circle, not go anywhere. Then later on, when you take a, want to take a left turn, then tilt left ways. So it's not necessary that uh, one mode of parenting is always going to work consistently throughout life. I'll talk a little later, if you get time, about different phases. Uh, during uh, the child's growth, and what what which metaphor will work? Okay, one more. Yeah, we'll come to you. That's what I was going to say. Is that uh, when they were little, I really held them and was more of like the potter. Yeah. And, you know, gave them freedom to experience. And my son's 18. It's only this year that he would just want us to make his decisions, <laughs> even though he had the will. Like he developed will as a child. You know, we never like shut him down in any way. And it's just now that I can see he's, you know, wanting to make his own choices. And I keep, my husband and I keep saying to each other, like, it's his life. <laughs> and I feel like that with my children, that they, it, it is their life. Um, you know, the, the driving thing, I feel like, um, I mean, it sounds ideal, but. You know, I'm not even sure in myself that I um, am good at following, you know, the skills and the direction. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's more about like, well, what kind of example have I led in my life? And that's really maybe what they're going to gravitate towards. That's true. So, you know, I worry a little bit about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, you wanted to say something? Yeah, well, it's one point uh, to do. Like, uh, I do understand with these three metaphors, somewhere or the other, are connected to each one of us. What I'm looking at, what I see is, is it not like what, how we make ourselves as an example as well? Like, for example, I want some ambitions will be there, or I want my son to be a tennis player, right? So. That is a seed what you have, and towards the gardening part. But at the same time, you're not providing this environment, and you're expecting. Like, example, I, yeah, I'll talk about this. Yeah. This exactly, you know, providing the supportive environment. I'll talk so about that one of the later. Be an example. I'll talk about that. Yes, we'll come to that. Thank you. So now, here, this I talked about this principle, three metaphors: is pottery, gardening, and driving. So the same PGD. You know, the basic principle is we need to guide in a detached way. So, karmanne vadhika raste ma faleshu kadachana ma karma falahetur bhur ma te sangostva karmani. It's a very important verse in the Bhagavad Gita. We have a right and a responsibility to take care of our children. Karmanne vadhika raste ma faleshu kadachana. Don't think that the children will be shaped that we don't we are not entitled to the results ma karma phala heturbhur why because we alone are not the shaper of the results and ma te sangostva karmani ma te sangostva karmani is don't just be don't be attached to inaction don't shirk the responsibility so the idea over here is 
that Krishna is saying take the responsibility of parenting but do it without attachment to a particular product. This is how my child should become. Mm -hmm. So how does this apply in a practical context, this principle of detachment? Mm -hmm. So he says detachment is not the absence of emotions. It is the absence of emotional dependence. Emotional dependence means that <clears throat> we, if the other person is say either displeased with us, then we just, even if the person has, is doing something wrong and we have to speak something strong, they just don't accept it. And because they are upset, we stay upset. So Dhritarashtra is, a, a, is attached. He is emotionally dependent. He just couldn't bear Duryodhana being displeased. And then Duryodhana made him dance like a puppet. Now this emotional dependence can be on children. That, oh, I can't hurt them. Of course, nobody, no parent wants to hurt them. But sometimes certain strong things have to be spoken. But the emotional dependence can also be in society at large. What will people think of us if you do this? So is people's opinion more important than the child's happiness? So detachment means detachment from both. We are not emotionally, we are not so emotionally insecure. And what will the world say? That becomes the sole determiner of our actions. And emotional dependence also means that lack of emotional dependence means also that just because there will be somebody will be displeased, we won't say something which is important also. So actually, detachment enables us to be responsible. Uh, often we ask, what is the difference between deta detachment and irresponsibility? Hmm? So usually, detachment is after we are doing our duty, we are not attached to the results. Irresponsibility is we don't do the duty itself. So detachment is after we have done the duty. That's why Krishna is saying, karmanne vadikaraste ma faleshu kadachana. That be detached. But he's not saying, he's also saying, mate sangostva karmani. Do not be attached to inaction. So parenting means this is how we, we do our part and we could say in a bigger picture, let Krishna do his part. So what would, how would this apply? So with respect to lack of emotional dependence, with respect to detachment, this is the third part, understanding what detachment is and what it isn't. So the first thing, especially when we go towards the teenage, See, when a baby is very small, at that time the baby starts crying. And then the parents struggle to figure out, why is, she, why, is, why is she crying? Is she hungry? Is her belly upset? Is she got some pain somewhere? Why is she crying? They, tr they have to struggle to figure it out. Now, we know that we need to understand because the babies can't communicate. Now, when, when people grow up and start speaking, we think they can communicate. But we also need to endeavor to understand others. Just because somebody is able to speak doesn't mean that they can communicate. And that doesn't mean that we are understanding them. So people need to feel understood before they will understand us. So this is, this is one of the main reasons why there is a generation gap. Because the generation gap happens because, say, the older generation feels that we know you should be doing this. Uh, and the older generation may feel, we have gone through the situation and we are telling you based on experience. But what happens is, we feel, no, it's different. The world you lived in was different. The world I lived in is different. So unless they feel understood, they won't be ready to understand. It's like, suppose you go to a doctor and before you sit on the physician's chair, the, the physician gives a prescription. Okay, take this medicine, take this medicine, take this. So what? I didn't tell you. I didn't tell what are the problems. No, I'm expert enough. I just by seeing I know what happened. Now, even if he were accurate, he even that physician were accurate, the patient wouldn't trust. So, so now this applies with respect to our children also. They need to feel understood. And understanding is to the human heart what oxygen is to the biological heart. So what happens if somebody is not having oxygen? Then they become restless. They become, they start, if somebody is drowning, they're not getting oxygen, they just start flapping, wailing their, waving their hands and legs. 
and now they might hit someone also and hit someone severely their intention is not to hit but they are flailing to hold on to something by which they can get the oxygen so similarly uh, i saw actually i saw a book on an airport where did my child go that was the name of the book so i thought maybe it's like a fiction with a child getting kidnapped or something like that but it was a parenting book and the theme was that i had this small sweet 3 year old 5 year old 7 year old and this child became a teenager and become sullen uncommunicative angry where did my child go <laughs> so what happens is that they may start speaking something very very outrageous very hurtful very strange but what is happening is they are struck they are struggling for oxygen they want to be understood now we may say what what is there what is there to be understood what is there to what are they what are we not understanding about them what is it that they are going through so here there is a identity confusion and identity crisis that everybody goes through once they come to teenage and what is that crisis that when somebody is a child pre teenage pre teen basically their identity is largely linked to their parents oh you know this 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 is this mother's son or this father's daughter or whatever that's how we refer to them also and they are also small enough so we could say to some extent that in the pre teen phase the children are like potters so the pot this is the potter who is shaping the pot that is the stage but once they they so when they come to teenage years they have become too old to just be satisfied with that identity oh i am so and so parents sir but at the same time they have not grown big enough to have their own identity hmm? they don't have a degree they don't have a job they don't have a position so at this time when they are in flux neither here nor there so what happens over there that causes a lot of disorientation and they also want acceptance in their social circle and and they want an identity which is acceptable and even respectable in their social circle so they come under a lot of peer pressure because maybe their parents had told me them you should live like this you should do this you should not do this and suddenly their peers start telling them you should do like this do like that so then they uh, we say that at a f- we are all souls who are parts of god see that is our fundamental identity but above that fundamental identity we have many functional identities so our functional identity might be say somebody might be a mother somebody might be a father somebody might be a software engineer somebody might be a teacher somebody might be a monk so all these are functional identities and sometimes we have different functional identities which pull us in different directions so they have one functional identity i am a child of my parents but they have another functional identity that okay now i am a student of so and so college or i want i am a member of so and so club in that college and i want to belong to there also so the way for belonging at home i need to be in a particular way for belonging in my social circle in college i need to be in a different way so which is my identity so they are going through this identity confusion and that's why because they are themselves lost and they don't it figured out what to do so they are like flailing for oxygen and so when they speak hurtfully or act unreasonably the one very important thing is don't take it too personally it is they say somebody is drowning and in order to catch something they move their hand and they slap us now their intention is not to slap us their intention is to get to something by which they will be able to get oxygen so uh, whatever they go through in the teenage we we have to be a little there is where detachment comes in you know how could my child say something like this to me and hey uh it is just not actually that i know it didn't mean like that they may often speak very hurtful things but they don't mean it it is they are in great tension and we shouldn't see, i know one friend no or i mean a friend's brother he is a teenage boy and he had a exam and he told his father you know please wake me up at this time and he had studied quite well and so he had only his father his mother was not there 
His father had worked very hard to take care of him in the absence of his mother for seven, eight years. And then his father thought he had studied. He woke him up. He didn't wake up. And if his father, he woke him again, he didn't wake up. His father thought that you know, he studied very hard, he had slept, slept very late. He says, let him sleep and he can go and uh, he can, he will, he's prepared enough. Then two, three hours later, he woke up. And he woke up and he was so angry. And he says, why didn't you wake me up? He says, you are such an incompetent parent. And then he said, I wish you had died instead of my mother. Now, the father was so hurt by that. Now, afterwards, you know, when he told me this, I said, how could you say this? I said, I also don't know. I never, I never thought like that till then. But at that time, it came out. So when he spoke like that, that created a breach in their relationship for a very long time. But he loaded, I never meant like that. So the point here is that don't see intention in what is spoken intention. When they're in, the kids in that age are in a lot of tension. When they're in tension, don't see intention over there. What kind of person will say something like this? Oh, no, it's not like that. They, may not, uh, they don't mean it. So a good example from scripture of this is when Sita made a horrible accusation against Lakshman uh, to send him away to help Ram. So Ra Lakshman, never, Lakshman couldn't bear it and naturally he was hurt. But he didn't hold it against her. He didn't tell Ram. You know, Sita spoke like that. It deserves, she deserves to be abducted. I'm not going to help you find her. He didn't hold it against her. So understand that when, he, when they do something, it will affect us, but don't take it too personally. Because they are going through their own crisis at this time. What happened? Is it? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So Mark Twain said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So basically, when they resolve their identity crisis and then they, they become adults, then they start seeing somewhat from the perspective that the parents are seeing. And then they appreciate, oh. What my parents said is right. So now, a 14-year-old cannot think the way a 21-year-old is thinking. It's, it's amazing how decades change our thinking changes. You know, I journal sometimes. And although now I have been a brahmachari for 20 years, uh, the way I used to think at 22, 23, the way I used to think at 35, and I think, who is this, who is this person who is thinking like this? <laughs> Our thinking changes substantially. So, if we are, if they seem to be not under getting what we are saying, don't take it too personally. Just be, we have to be patient. The way they think at that age, you cannot, you cannot bring a 21 year old thinking at the age of 14. So we need to be patient over here. So patience is also a part of detachment. Now when we are attached, we want things to happen and happen immediately. But we, need, if we are detached, then we can be patient. Then, and the important thing is with respect to understanding. Even parents may say that, you know, I am ready to hear, but my child doesn't speak to me only. Any of you have this experience? Yes. Yeah. Don't speak at all. So now here, see, we are very social creatures, and we respond, we respond very sharply to social feedback. So parents need, need to reinforce the desirable behavior, not the undesirable behavior. What does that mean? That, say, say suppose I am speaking right now, and while speaking something, if everybody starts frowning and glaring at me, then naturally I'll think, did I, what did I speak? Maybe I stopped speaking what I was speaking. <laughs> because we are so sensitive to feedback. So I know in one place I go, uh, there's a program, and there's one person who comes, sits right in front, and throughout the class, he's glaring at me. <laughs> Not just staring, glaring. 
<laughs> so the only way I can give a class over there is to look at everyone except him. <laughs> so what happens is we are very responsive to feedback from others. So if someday you know, your child says, you know, something interesting happened today. As soon as they say that, you know, put your phone down. Just give them your full attention. If you do that, then that shows them that you want to hear. But if, say I just pick up the phone and keep talking on the phone, and then later on you happen, hey, you said something interesting happened, what happened, tell me. So by that time, they feel actually you're not interested. So on the few occasions when they speak, how you respond is very important. Over the years, and <clears throat> I've been traveling and speaking. So earlier I was, I just used to give a class and just leave after the class. But I used to find my classes were very abstract. But now I try to follow a policy that on, during the class I speak. After the class I hear. I ask questions and let people speak. Then I understand where they are coming from. And then I learn so much. And then, then during the classes, if you know where people are coming from, you can just make some small connections and things become more relevant. Of course, I have to work a lot on the relevance, but I have found that hearing helps us understand where people are coming from. And people, it takes, it takes effort also for, for people to open up. So we need to recognize that we need to, if they speak something on their own, just give them attention. And then hear them out before judging. So this is what happened in school. How could you do that? And once, you, once they start judging, now they will close up. They will not speak at all. Now does this mean I'm saying we should never judge? One part of guiding is judging. But first hear them out. Then, with respect to judging, now all this, I am including all this in detachment. Detachment because the idea is that if we think that our children should be like this, and how can they be anything like this, apart from that? that? That detachment comes when we are ready to accept them for what they are. So, make judgments, but don't be judgmental. We have to make judgments. Sometimes somebody is doing something wrong, and that has to be pointed out. But being judgmental means attacking the person itself. You know, it's putting ourselves in a superior position and attacking the person itself. If we are judgmental, then people just get, uh, uh, get so lost by that. They just uh, can't uh, continue. In fact, in religious circles, there is a symptom called PK. PK is not a Bollywood movie PK. Uh, PK basically means preacher's kids. So in Christianity, there is this phenomena that preacher's kids often don't even become Christians. What to speak of preachers? Because they feel that we were always judged. And that they, find that they find that people around them are very judgmental. So now what is the difference between making judgments and being judgmental? That is broadly now, we could communicate in three broad ways. I call that as prescriptive, normative, and descriptive. Prescriptive is do this, don't do this. Mm. And in some cases, where there is a clear hierarchy of authority, prescription can be done. Like a doctor gives a prescription. Take this medicine and don't eat this. Mm. In most human relationships, prescriptive doesn't work. Especially with adults or those who think they are adults, prescri being prescriptive, it just alienates. Hmm? The other could be normative. This is right, this is wrong. So, being normative also, it, it makes one sound judgmental. The same thing could be spoken in a descriptive way. Descriptive way means that this is what I do and this is why I do it. <coughs> I was in Canada, I was talking with a parent 
whose son they went through a phase where Indian parents, very nice Brahmin family, and the son went through a phase where he started taking drugs in the college. And then he was he explored it for two, three months, and then he gave it up. So I was talking with the parents, and the parents said that, you know, the mother said, I was in so much anxiety, what will happen if he does this? So then he said that at that time, you know, we we prayed and we read, and then he said that we just let our him speak whatever he was going through. So it was not that he was interested in drugs, but certain things had happened in his college, he was very lonely, he was, and there are deeper issues. So the drugs was just a symptom that he was acting out because he was so desperate, so lonely, so depressed. So when he let him speak out, he came and told, you know, I took drugs today in college. What? How could you take it? That was their, that would have been their response, but he asked, what happened? What made you take it? And, and he started opening out. When he saw that my parents are not condemning me for it, then he started opening out. And eventually, when his basic, when he felt that, oh, I'm still loved, I'm still valued. And he was going through some issues in college. And uh, uh, it, uh, it went, it got over and he was able to get over it. See, what happens is, some things might seem very small for us, but for, for somebody else, it might be very big. So, maybe in their college, maybe they don't get into a particular, uh, they don't get, get belong to a particular group, or they don't get in, uh, get in membership or something, or whatever. What is the big deal for us? We might say, but it's not for them. So, basically, uh, we can tell them, but hear them out. Descriptive means, you know, okay, then the and the mother told she told me that I told my child how her mother had passed away and her father was very distant. She said, I went through a phase of loneliness in my life. And this is what I did at that time. Now it's the, the he had always seen his mother as a mother. He never thought, oh, you also went through a phase of loneliness. What did you do? So when it became descriptive, it, rather than seeing, you know, you are here and you give me instruction. Like we are all on the same journey. And yes, I have gone through some more experiences and I can share some insights. But to the extent we make it descriptive, to the extent it will not appear domineering, it will not appear intrusive. We do have to give guidance, but try to do it as much as possible in a descriptive way. Of course, one danger in descriptive way is that we just become autobiographical. Autobiographical means that their problem becomes an impetus for retelling our own story 127th time. <laughs> you know, how, with how much, how, how poor we were when we came and how hard I worked and how, what I all I did. <laughs> Not like that. But specifically, that similar situation if we have some experience. Descriptive, or you could tell, you know, okay, my friend and my colleague had this issue and this is what they did. So, descriptive way is a very good way of providing guidance. Then, in this, follow Krishna's example. What does Krishna do at the end of the Bhagavad Gita? Krishna respects Arjuna's free will. In 1863, he says, Vimri Shaita He says, deliberate deeply and then do as you desire. Do as you desire, he says. So we cannot control them, but give them the resources to think. The resources to take a well-informed decision. So God doesn't walk for us. It is we who have to walk in our life journey. But he can walk with us. He's there with us in our hearts. It is we who have to choose. He will guide us to choose. So similarly, we can't walk for our children. But we can walk with them. We can walk with them means that we can actually help them when they make the choices. This brings us back to the driving metaphor. That it is we cannot take the wheels from their hands. The wheels are always going to be with them. But we can help them to choose. So Going on, there are two modes, even when you are practicing bhakti, there are two modes of surrender. 
there is diligence for Krishna and there is dependence on Krishna and both can apply in parenting also diligence for Krishna means Arjuna surrenders to Krishna but he takes up the bow ready to fight and dependence on Krishna means Draupadi raising her hands so especially if the children are small it is the love that guards you know, they're like diligence for Krishna now, okay we just keep danger trouble away from the children we guard them but once they go into trains we cannot have the love that guards because their world has become much bigger than just our home and then the love has to take a different form the love that guides and after guiding if they don't choose what we want them to choose then we have to be we have to have dependence on krishna and it is not just uh, we who are going to shape their lives krishna is in their in their hearts so bhakti requires sometimes that we diligently fight sometimes we dependently let go and if we understand the same principle we apply when i said follow krishna's example that the point here is both of these are required at different times and especially as they grow older then it is more of we have to become like draupadi not always but at times <laughs> so now in the diligence for krishna there are broadly three things we could do with which i'll conclude this example mm -hmm. what happened okay okay no problem so th these three things are broadly earlier talked about setting an example so you mentioned that those three things are um, engagement enlightenment and encouragement so enlightenment means simply means what i talked about descriptive if you do this this will happen if you do this this will happen that's enlightenment rather than telling do this and don't do this just help them see the choices and consequences thank you so uh, help them to see this action will lead to this reaction one of my friends told me he's writing a book on the 10 commandments of the bhagavad gita so there the bible has 10, 10 commandments so i told him please don't write a book like this because the bhagavad gita's mood is not a mood of giving commandments bhagavad gita's mood is of choices and consequences so enlightenment means help them to see instead of saying don't do this Prabhupada said in one this very beautiful point actually one of the senior leaders of our movement who was a college preacher during Prabhupada's time he told me that Prabhupada told him that the worst thing you can do while preaching Krishna consciousness in your in the colleges is present Krishna consciousness as a set of rules he says present Krishna consciousness as a philosophy and within that philosophy give a multi-level explanation of the rules if you say don't go off the left side don't go on the right side help them see the road and help them go along the road if they can see the road they will go along so enlightenment means give them the vision to make the right choices engagement means provide the resources to make the right choices so resources means for example this kind of career counseling seminar is there now where some of you said that you know they don't listen to us but then get them in the social circle which is a healthy circle lateral learning often helps much better that's encouragement then there is engagement and that is uh, provide them some engagement by which they can gravitate towards healthier choices and lastly that is encouragement encouragement means that when we are with them there can be ups and downs in the relationships and in love there will always be expectation but love shouldn't be conditional to expectation love will always come with expectation you can't avoid that there's but love shouldn't be con conditional to expectation means this is what we may say this is what i feel you should do but whatever you do we are with you so once they feel that i am accepted for who i am let's see if this gets connected this is an online slideshow so this is a little older version Not coming anyway. 
So, yeah. So long again, we'll come back to the same point that be patient because the long-term relationship is more important than the short-term results. Short-term result is that you no, know, oh, you should do this, you should not do this. Sometimes somebody may go make a wrong choice, and they will learn and they will come back. But if you force them, don't choose this. Now it's not. I'm saying always this way. But if you force them, then they may resent it throughout their life. And what may hurt the relationship, we don't know. You asked about how parents may, uh, how our children may go away from Krishna. Mm -hmm. uh, a typical way it is, I was talking with one boy, and you know he got a phone call. I said, I looked at his phone, and it was written over oh, there, jail. Jail. I said, you are getting a call from jail? So no, that's my home. <laughs> so <laughs> he felt his home to be like a jail. <laughs> so I wonder whether his parents had seen that. <laughs> but <clears throat> the point is that ultimately, uh, so he said that he said I had a very big fallout with my parents. And I understand now what they, they were right. But if what happens sometimes we may say, you, know, you are wrong and you are not listening to me. One day you will come back crawling on your knees to me. Oh. <laughs> now, even if they realize they are wrong, they will not come back. <laughs> because it has become an issue of the ego. So, we may want them to do the right thing. And that is the result we want. But sometimes, you know, letting somebody do the wrong thing may be better for the relationship. The long-term relationship is more important than the short-term result. And this also requires detachment. So, if we have these broad principles, then it becomes easier to follow in Krishna's footsteps. And just as Krishna is detached, he is our parent, and we are his children. He has given us free will. And he guides us. Of course, we as parents, physical parents, have much more immediate connection and immediate responsibilities. But still, that is a good template on which to base our parenting. And eventually, the impressions that we have given, they will not get lost. They may be obscured for temporarily, but eventually they will come back. And they will come on the right track. But we need patience. And that patience comes when we have a certain level of detachment. So I'll summarize what I spoke. I started by sp uh, speaking about how you know, we, can folk, we can link parenting with primarily our human journey. And I spoke more as a human being, so facing the challenge of guiding anyone. And I talked about, in parenting broadly, <clears throat> there can be three, meta, uh, three metaphors. Does anyone remember three metaphors? Pottery, 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 pottery gardening, gardening, gardening driving. driving, yeah. So in pottery, it's primarily we shape the pot. In driving, in gardening, it's the seed itself grows, we just facilitate its growth. And in driving, it's more that each person has their own car, but we teach them driving skills and give them broad directions. So often balance requires us to shift between different metaphors. But the idea is we need to help them grow in a way that is effective. And then that PGD3 metaphor, I'll talk about parents need to guide in a detached way, detachedly. Detached means lack of, not lack of emotion, but lack of emotional dependence. Both emotional dependence on the child, or oh, my child should not be displeased with me. And emotional dependence on society, what will people think of? Then detachment means that we recognize that a 14 year old can't think like a 21 year old. So we be patient. Detachment means that, uh, that <coughs> I talk about, we hear them out. We reinforce the desired behavior. Don't take their harsh words or their unreasonable actions personally. Because they are in an identity confusion in the teenage years. So help them, help them understand themselves. And when they hear, when they want to speak, just hear them. And even if we have to give a judgment, first hear them out. And with respect to giving judgment, don't be judgmental. That means don't be prescriptive or uh, normative, be descriptive. And then lastly, I talked about how in our journey, uh, <clears throat> I actually started by talking about how parent guidance like Drona gave can be common as well as customized. 
So to draw the long circle around, circle around that, you know, when we are guiding that at that time, we can, en we can, can give enlightenment, we can give encouragement, and we can give engagement by which they will grow. And the relationship is more important than the specific choice or the specific result. If you are patient, then gradually they will find their way and the, they will eventually be on the right track. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So do we have some time? Or what? Ten, minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, thank you. So any reflections? Yes. Yeah, please. You know, I, I, this is very interesting uh, presentation. Um, you know, I mean, do you have some advice um, on how we can become more detached? Because as a parent, it's very difficult. What you're telling us is, I think, theoretically, it makes sense. But how do we go up? You know, how do we get there? Right? I mean, I myself have practiced different types of parenting as my kids have grown along and I've learned, right? As a new parent, it was always trying to mold them into the way we want them. Then you learn that that's not the way that it works. Then I'm at a stage now where I have to let go because he's um, going to college. But I, I'm finding it very hard. So um, do you have any guidance on what would help us become more detached? Yeah. So how can we become more detached? So generally, any kind of letting go makes us feel deprived. It makes us even feel guilty, irresponsible, empty. So it's very difficult to let go. And the whole Bhagavad Gita's message is, its thrust is not on detachment. Till the sixth chapter, Krishna is talking again and again about virakti, anasakti. But the seventh chapter onwards, the first line itself is Mai Asaktamanaha. Mai Asaktamanaha. Make your mind attached to me. So, detachment is actually the launching pad for a higher attachment. Krishna says, be detached from the world so that you can be attached to the source of the world, to Him. So, similarly, detachment itself is very difficult. We think, oh, this is a relationship and I will detach myself from it. You think only in that term, in any relationship, just deta detachment is difficult. But if we see that we are agents of Krishna, and Krishna can act through us, and Krishna can act through others also. So if we see that, say, this, the children are here, I am here. So we have a horizontal relationship. Horizontal in the sense that we are all human beings. Within that specific relationship, we might be parents, so it's somewhat vertical. But we are all souls. So that's a horizontal relationship. And then there's a vertical relationship with Krishna, which we have, which they have. So for us, to the extent we focus on the vertical relationship, to that extent we can play our role appropriately in the horizontal relationship. How does that work out? That means we understand if we become strongly connected with Krishna, now, strongly connected doesn't just mean we come more to the temple or chant more rounds. Strongly connected means we become strongly sheltered in our relationship with Krishna. That whatever happens, in my defining identity, as long as I think, if my defining identity is a parent, then any, if anything goes wrong with my child, I can't bear it. If I think my defining identity as a, as a teacher, and if I find that my students are failing, how can my student fail? It is, it is, it is my failure. But if my defining identity is as a soul who is a part of Krishna, and as a part of Krishna, I am taking the role of a parent. I am taking the role of a teacher. The role is important for me, but I am different from the role. So to the extent our defining identity is Krishna, is in our relationship with Krishna, I am a part of Krishna, then we do our role responsibly, but at the same time we understand this is a role. And sometimes Krishna empowers us uh, to play a role, and sometimes Krishna empowers someone else, someone else to play a role at that particular point. So the roles don't stay static all the time. So we need to be sheltered in Krishna, that Krishna, 
no, I, you may, you you given me this child, you are giving me this service as a parent, or I have this service as a parent in your service. So I will do it as well as I can. But when things are beyond my control, then it's not just I entrust my child to you, but I connect with you more. And as long as we are, as long as we are not ourselves secure, then whatever the child does, it will we will overreact to it. Uh, I was with one Gurukuli boy, and he was telling me that my whole, my most prominent childhood memory is my parents' disappointment because I was not the reincarnation of Prahlad Maharaj. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so, uh, you know, if if they, they're very alert, you know, children are very sharp in their own ways. So they start understanding, you know, where we are coming from. So if you know, just to improve our social image or our social spiritual image, we want our children to be in a particular way. Then it look good in society. Then it is we who are insecure. And then our actions come out of that platform of insecurity. But if we become secure in our relationship with Krishna, that Krishna, I am your part and I'll serve you and I'll do this service as well as I can, then we can let go. It's never easy, but we, we don't feel guilty or irresponsible in letting go. Why? Because we are entrusting that person to Krishna. We see our horizontal relationship, but we see our vertical relationship and we see their vertical relationship also. Even if they don't act in that relationship right now, but still Krishna is in their hearts. And then we connect with Krishna more and more. Then when we are more secure in our relationship with Krishna, we will also be able to speak more calmly. We will not overreact. And then we'll find that balance between you know, not being irresponsible, but at the same, at the same time not being overbearing. Okay? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay. Well, just to reinforce your point, one Srila Prabhupada disciple who was a Nyasi disciple and he got attracted to the opposite sex and spreading my day. So he came to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, uh, you will reject me because this happened with Chota Aridas and Chikane Mahaprabhu rejected Chota Aridas. Mupa said that was Chitra Mahaprabhu, he was God. Who am I to reject you? I need every one of you. So just to be reinforcing your point that sometimes we as parents, we have this superiority complex that I know much more than my child. Therefore I can push and pull and it, but if that horizontal relationship says, okay, my child is going through something, I'm also going through something. I also have my, um, what was that word you used? Huh? Insecurity. Ins I also have my insecurity. Yeah, insecurities. I don't you use the word. Identity crisis. Identity, Identity crisis. crisis. Perfect. So if parent feels genuinely that I also have my identity crisis, horizontal and yeah. vertical, then it's very easy to let go. I feel that's that's the crux of matter, you know. Parents don't feel that I have that parents say, oh I'm twenty years ahead of the game. I I figure all out so now I can die. So just just issue. Yeah. Thank you very much. Shla Prabhupada ki yeah. Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki yeah. Tai Gaur Premanande. Yeah.